be seated. Good morning and welcome to this service of worship this morning and also remembrance of the life of Wynne Elzinga. My name is Mike Borgert. I'm the pastor here at Grace Christian Reformed Church. Had the pastor, uh, or had the privilege of being pastor to uh, Win for these last uh, two and a half years that I've been here, and uh, enjoyed visiting with him very much, and uh, also with Marg and Michelle, and uh, Aaron and Jolene and their family, and getting to know them, and uh, and Greg and Dwayne and their families uh, as well. Just in the last day or so. Uh, you are all warmly invited to uh, join us at the cemetery after the service. I know, given the weather, um, that's probably not uh, something that's terribly appealing <laughs> to most of us, uh, but uh, you are invited to join us in the, at the cemetery for the graveside and then also here back at church after the graveside for, for lunch, and you can greet the family at that point and, and uh, have some time with them to share your memories and to comfort and encourage them. Will you please join me in prayer? Gracious God, we remember before you this day our brother, Win Elzinga. We thank you for giving him to us, his family and friends, to know as a companion on this earthly journey. In your deep love for us, we pray. Comfort us as we mourn. Give us the faith to see in death the entrance to eternal life so that in quiet confidence we may have the grace to continue our course here on earth until by your call we are reunited with Wynne and all those who've gone before us on that day when we see you face to face. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord we pray, amen. Will you please stand for the call to worship In the Gospel of John, when Jesus went to the grave of his friend Lazarus and comforted his family, he said these words, and these words are to us as well this morning. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. People of God, receive his greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from Jesus Christ, his Son, our Savior and Lord, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing our opening hymn, Be Unto Your Name.
This time, Wynn's sons, Greg, Dwayne, and Aaron, come to share some memories of their dad and make a tribute to him. everyone and uh, thank you for coming to remember my father. Um, I'm, for those of you who don't know, I'm Greg, his oldest son. Um, it's funny when you write out this thing and it's all formal and then you get up here and you're like, hmm, I'm not really happy with what I wrote. <laughs> uh, I'll try to, uh, I got some input from my brother Jeff, and my cousin Val for some things to remember and uh, Oh, thanks. Is that better? <laughs> uh, I'm not going to repeat what I said. <laughs> uh, so, um, when Elzinger was a man who meant so much to so many people, when was not only a devoted father, brother, and friend, but also a skilled engineer and a true character. As we gather here, we'll take a few moments to share some memories and stories to showcase the incredible person he was. Wynn and his brother Mel had a special bond as children, being the youngest of eight and only 12 months apart in age. I think I got that one right. Um, I know it's super close. <laughs> uh, they were inseparable, often found holding hands with their arms around each other, raised primarily Raised primarily by their Aunt Gertie, they were taught the importance of hard work, attention to detail, often tasked with cleaning chores like mopping under the beds, polishing old ten pairs of Sunday shoes. Uh, there's a story I'm sure that <clears throat> I think Belle and her family can relate to. Uh, my dad, when he used to teach us when we had to do our Sunday chores of vacuuming, one of the things we had to make sure was that we took the dusting brush and went along all the baseboards and all the tops of the doors in the frames. And my brother Jeff always was trying to get out as fast as possible. And invariably my dad finger found the area that he skipped and he'd have to be back and do the whole thing over again. <laughs> uh, the brothers were also mischievous. They would often sneak into Aunt Gertie's pantry to steal jars of canned fruit. And as teenagers, they would quietly, quietly crawl out of their second story bedroom window to hang out with friends. Um, with uh, one memorable incident also involved with when uh, demonstrating to Mel that you didn't need to use a clutch to change the gears in a car, a lesson that ended with a broken transmission in a tow truck. Uh, Wynn's love of puns was legendary and endures in our memories of him today. Even one of the nursing staff that came today to pay her respects, to, that was her biggest, one of her biggest memories of dad. Um, he shared many similarities with his brother Mel, including a love for cooking and fishing, and family trips to Rice Lake were cherished memories with the two of them bringing home strings of impressive catches. That's a bit of an embellishment, but... <laughs> um, Wynn's career as an engineer took him and his family to various places across Canada, 
from constructing highways in Ontario to building power stations in Newfoundland and even up to Frobisher Bay, in Fort, uh, in, uh, which is now Nunavut. His work not only contributed to the development of Canada, but also sparked a passion for good food and fine cooking with the people that he met along the way. When loved sharing meals with family and friends, making dinner at his house was an event to remember. One of the things that I always, dad always did carried on from his family tradition <clears throat> was uh, my grandfather always set an extra plate and every time one of our friends would come by, um, my dad would always, his phrase was always, pull up a floorboard. And if we were in the middle of dinner, join us for dinner, we're having dessert, join us. You know, everybody was always welcome to have a meal. And who couldn't, finish, who couldn't forget uh, Wynn's famous nap times? He would doze off reading to his children, only to be woken up to turn the page. The habit continued with his grandchildren, serving as a reminder that naps are essential for everyone's well-being. <clears throat> Wynn taught us many important life lessons, to be strong in our convictions, to put family first and find humor in every situation. He showed us that patience and perseverance were keys to success and that it was up to us to find our purpose in life. As we say goodbye to Wynn today, remember the love, laughter, and wisdom he brought to our lives. We know that he's in a better place, forever in our hearts as our dear father and grandfather. And as we continue to honor his memory, we can be sure that Wynn was always having a laugh, even if it was at everyone else's groans. Thank you for the wonderful memories, Dad, and the legacy you left behind. I'll miss you. Thank you all for coming. Um, growing up with my dad, I believe I was the luckiest with the best dad. Saturdays were often our elaborate brunches, and Sundays were no different when dad pulled out all the bells and whistles. Weekends were filled with gardening, fishing, camping, and visits to work sites, which was my favorite. During these times, Dad would share often his wisdom, which has much informed how I live my life today. Dad was much loved grandpa to my kids, Zachary and Adriana, and when we moved to Saskatchewan, he flew out for a visit. And they instilled his love for fishing with Zach when we took him and Greg for a trip out on the lakes. He also shared his love for golf with Zach. Adriana had always loved to hear the stories of Dad's work. We enjoy hearing about the projects too. Dad, you will be missed. Good morning. On behalf of our entire family, thank you for the outpouring of support, love, most of all prayers. Not only over the last couple of weeks, but through the last few years, his dad's health was deteriorating. In the days leading up to the lockdown in 2020, dad's physical health was at a crisis point. And as much as mom did at home, it became clear he was going to need more help. An answer to prayer and an opening at Blenheim Community Village allowed dad to enter his new home just days before the world would lock down because of COVID. The love and genuine care shown to dad was clear over the last three years, but even more visible over the last couple of weeks. Almost every employee came in to share a story, give him a hug, just to let him know how special he was. To the staff at Blenheim Community Village, our sincerest thank you for loving Dad as much as we do. Thank you to our entire Grace Church family for surrounding us all with prayers for so long now. Thank you for helping our family prepare for today. In 1988, we lost our dad, and suddenly Mom, Michelle, and I were alone. We didn't know the plans God had for us, but so many prayers were answered when a man from our very own church, who unfortunately was also going through his own family crisis, would soon become such a huge part of our life. Mom and Mr. E, as Michelle and I called him at first, started dating and within a few times of meeting him, it was clear how genuine and caring he was. As their relationship progressed to marriage almost 30 years ago, it was clear that God had a special plan in place. Michelle and I never called him stepdad, here in the role and title of dad, by the way he loved, cared, and cherished her mom. He loved Michelle and I as his own, and we have always been honored to call him dad. Greg, Jeff, and Dwayne, and I know Jeff's watching online, 
Thank you for sharing your dad with Michelle and I. Although you were older than Michelle and I, leading your own lives before mom and dad got married, you always treated us well. I'll always appreciate the Tigers game you took me to, Greg. Dad was always excited about the simplest things, a dinner, a nice song, a campfire with his friends, and even the smallest fish caught. Words like amazing, so cool, beautiful, were used so many times, time and time again, even the last couple weeks. Imagine him standing right now in glory today, surrounded by the wonder that God promises for his believers. He might still be inside the, the gates trying to grasp the words. Little or big things never really seemed to get him. He was so easygoing. Easygoing enough to let me and my friends as teenagers take out his beloved Buick Roadmaster, towing his boat so many summer days. He taught me responsibility, how to do so many things that I have the good fortune of passing down to our children. He didn't let me do these things to get my approval. It's just who he was. Waxed and gassed, here you go, Aaron, have a great time. Easy going, almost to a fault at times. I can still hear mom saying, when you're not wearing that, it doesn't match. <laughs> Dad loved his daughter-in-law, my wife Jolene, and would spoil her with a big pot of soup every weekend for the week ahead. He and her easily exchanged puns and a little bit of sarcasm too. He loved our kids, and being Papa was an absolute joy. This past Sunday, our kids got to hug him and say goodbye, and even in his final hours, still managed a beautiful, as Maggie did a gymnastics move in his room. He loved seeing John's hockey games on TV recently and loved the highlight of his most recent goal. And Grace, he's smiling down on you today as you read today's scripture passages. Papa loved all his grandchildren very, very much. Dad was great at his career and as a well-respected engineer. Mom would often say they couldn't go anywhere without dad knowing someone and having a long conversation. He loved to golf with Ralph, fish with Uncle Brad, and was so thrilled when Uncle Jerry brought his RV out to Blenheim and organized a camp out fish fry. Absolutely awesome. Thank you to all his friends who stood by him through so many good times and throughout the more recent, tougher times. Dad always had a special place in his heart for Michelle and always helped her wherever he could. She would even become a trusted employee at Thames Valley Engineering for Dad. And with that special relationship, Michelle in turn would take over that role of looking out for Dad especially over the last couple of years. Every night, Michelle would make sure to send Dad a Bible text and ensure he had the best collection of Christian music to listen to throughout the long nights in his room. Mom, your love, your dedication, and commitment to Dad throughout your marriage was a testament to your vows. Even though more recently, through sickness and health, sickness seemed to be underlined at times, you didn't waver in your faithfulness to your husband, visiting daily in his new home. It was wonderful to see how he treated you throughout your marriage with dinner dates every Friday night, for example, even though that meant Michelle and I had to clear out. Not every marriage is perfect and there was ups and downs, but at the root of your love for each other remained a stable foundation set on God's word. Dad was a Christian and as recently as a few weeks ago, he told me clearly he believes in God and he knew Jesus as his savior. Mom, as you held dad, as he took his finally earthly breaths before he was welcomed into the kingdom of heaven, know that you did everything humanly possible for dad. And he, and he is eternally grateful for your love and commitment. No one could have predicted the physical struggles that he would endure over the last several years of his life, but God knew he had a faithful servant in you, Mom, who was always going to be by his side no matter what. We love you, Dad, and we look forward to the day when we're reunited in heaven again. Thank you. Thanks, Greg and Duane and Aaron very much uh, for those memories. Our statement of faith is taken from the Heidelberg Catechism, the first question and answer of the Catechism. And there we read these words. What is your only comfort in life and in death? 
And the answer, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has also set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. This time, Wynne's granddaughter Grace comes to do the scripture readings. Second Corinthians 3, verse 17 to 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We sing, yet not I, but through Christ in me. What gift of grace
Psalm 73, verses 23 to 26. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Thanks, Grace. <clears throat> if you read Psalm 73, the psalm that these ver- those verses, Grace, just read are taken from. Psalm 73 seems to be a a mature, realistic faith. It's, It's not the exuberant praise that we sometimes read in other psalms. Psalm 73 kind of has this way of conveying a faith that's been through the struggles of life. In a way, It's one of those psalms that's addressed to all of us. The psalm in the first verse says, Surely God is good to Israel. Now that means the people of Israel, the Jewish people, God's Old Testament covenant people. But beyond that, that word Israel literally means the one who struggles with God. And and this psalm seems to highlight that kind of faith, a faith that struggles with God, a, a faith that wrestles and asks deep questions. Surely God is good to those who struggle, to those who wrestle, to those who ask questions, and to those who are pure in heart, We sometimes have this idea of of being pure in heart as never doing anything wrong. You know, being righteous, checking off all the boxes. And it might have that kind of sense of that word, but, but in Hebrew, in the language that Old Testament was written in, to be pure in heart meant to be devoted to someone or something, to be committed And this psalm is written to those kind of people. People who are devoted, who are committed to God, and who yet struggle, who wrestle with God, those who are Israel. And at times like funerals, we have a sense of that kind of faith ourselves, many of us. We're devoted we're committed and yet we struggle. We wrestle. When Elzinga was one who was devoted, committed, as we heard from Greg and Dwayne and Aaron, committed to his family, to his work, to God, to his church. But he was one who also struggled at times. Now, most of the time, when you'd go to see Wynn, in spite of how he might have really been feeling, you said, hey, how are you, Wynn? Oh, good, good, great. (laughs) And yet, you knew he probably wasn't telling you the whole truth. And you know, for us, as we gather here today and remember his life, We remember the kind of faith he had, the faith that, yes, was devoted, was committed, but also struggled, wrestled with God. Those verses that Grace read just a minute ago, they begin with that word yet. Yet I am always with you. It's a a conjunction, a, a word that connects the statements he makes with what's gone before. In 
it seems like a, an insignificant word in English. It's only three letters. It's even less significant in Hebrew. It's, it's just a prefix that's kind of attached to the front of another word. Yet, he says, it's a reference to what's gone before. The, the writer of this psalm is, is wondering, he's reflecting on life, he's wondering about the things that he struggles with, that he wrestles with. And, and the things that he recounts in the early verses of this psalm are the things that a lot of us maybe struggle with. He looks around and he wonders why it is that evil people seem to prosper, why it is that good people seem to struggle. He wonders if his faith is in vain, especially when the struggle, the suffering seems relentless. And for, for those of us who, who knew Wynn's struggles over the last few years, and even before he went into the nursing home, I mean, the, the, the suffering, the struggle, the wrestling was long. It, was, it wasn't a, a few days or weeks. It was years. And yet, he continued to wrestle with God. He continued to have that pure in heart kind of quality. One who was devoted, committed. Yet, refers to all those struggles that the psalmist talks about that he, in those earlier verses. But then it, that word connects that stuff to what he says after. Yet, in spite of all that, in spite of the questions, in spite of the struggles, in spite of the wondering, yet, I am always with you. It's as if he's saying, God's presence is enough. The struggles don't have the last word. Those questions might never be answered this side of eternity. We don't always or maybe even very often receive answers to those questions. Think of other people that we read about in Scripture. Job, who for all the struggles he went through, asked God those questions. And at the end of the day, the thing is, if you read the end of the book of Job, God never gives Job an answer, really, to his questions. The only answer he gives is God himself. It's as if God is saying, my presence is enough. There's no answer sometimes to those why questions. Maybe the answer is a who. God himself. God's presence. And the, the psalmist says there are three ways that God demonstrates his presence toward the psalmist and us. God embraces them. He says he holds them by his right hand. He guides him with his counsel. And he promises to receive him into glory. And then there, there seems to be this shift in verse 25. All those questions that the psalmist has recounted in the verses before, the quality of the questions changes. The psalmist says, whom have I in heaven but you? The answer, of course, is pretty obvious. No one. And what does earth have that I can desire besides you? And again, the obvious answer is nothing. The psalmist is affirming that yes, the struggles, the wrestling is real, but so is the presence of God. A lot of times in life, if you've lived very long, you find out that the the crucial thing is asking the right questions. The answers we arrive at are in large part determined by the kinds of questions we ask. The question we asked just a few moments ago, what is your only comfort in life and in death? 
that I am not my own, but belong body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. For, and for another catechism, the first question and answer of the Westminster, what is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Those are questions of, of purpose and meaning. The kinds of questions that the psalmist asked. In those verses that Grace read, they conclude with verse 26, my heart and my flesh may fail. And for those of us who knew the struggles win went through the last number of years, that's a pretty accurate description. His body began to break down. His mind was always sharp. He was working until, what, like three months ago? <laughs> Call him sometimes and, what are you up to? And, oh, at the office, he'd say. <laughs> his heart and his flesh began to fail. His physical body began to break down. And just as he began these verses with a, a conjunction, yet, yet I am always with you. These verses end with a different conjunction. Again, a seemingly insignificant word, but man, one that plays an important part. But God. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever but God is the strength of my heart. Even though my physical health may fail, even though I have this struggle, God is my strength. God's my portion forever. The word there is literally sufficiency. God is enough, the psalmist is saying. Questions not like the ones the psalmist asks in those earlier verses. Questions not like, why would God allow wind to struggle for so long the way he did? But rather maybe the different kinds of questions that the psalmist transitions to. Questions like, how can we have the grace to face the struggles in life that we have the way Wynn faced his struggles? How do we have a, a hope for the future? Especially as we anticipate this coming week, celebrating Holy Week, we're reminded how it is that we have that grace to face the struggles in life that we have. How it is that we have hope for the future, not because of what we do, but because of what God has done for us. Because as the psalmist testifies to God's presence, we know that the, the fullness of that presence came to us in Jesus Christ, the one who lived and died for us and rose again to give us new life. As a, as a proclamation that the struggles don't have the last word. Our physical strength, our limited knowledge, our finite answers to the eternal questions like the ones the psalmist asked, all of those things eventually fail or at least come up short. And yet, we read those words, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God is the strength of Wynne Elzinga and his portion forever. The real question then becomes, how can I be with this God? Wynne knew the answer to that question and he wouldn't want anyone to leave here today not knowing the answer to that question. 
The psalm concludes, but as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all his wonderful deeds. Have you made the sovereign Lord your refuge, your strength? It doesn't mean that you'll never have struggles, that you'll never wrestle. In fact, as I said, this psalm is addressed to Israel, the ones who struggle, who wrestle with God, but yet the ones who are pure in heart, who are devoted, committed to God, the God who is with us in his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are with us. That you are always with us and that you are our strength and our portion forever. When our strength and our sufficiency fails, you are there that you hold us by our hand, that you guide us with your counsel, that you welcome us into your presence as you've welcomed Wynne Elzinga. We pray, O Lord, that as we go from this place, you would go with us. Remind us in big and small ways of your presence that is always with us so that we always desire to be with you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We stand as we sing our song of response. When peace like a river
please pray with me? Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Wynne Elzinga. Acknowledge him, we humbly pray, as a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy and into the blessed rest of everlasting peace and into the glorious company of the saints in heaven. We pray all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, people of God, receive his blessing as you go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his face upon you and give you his peace both now and forevermore. Amen.